Sometimes it feels like God isn't there, right? Sometimes it feels like he's really afar off. Well, it's sometimes because he is. I'm Bishop Maldonado. Welcome to Inspiration Moments. Jesus gives us this story in Matthew 25 of this wealthy man who gives each of his servants bags of money. And then the scripture tells us the most amazing things. After he divides it up in proportion to their ability, it says, then he went on a long trip. And I want to say something to you that most preachers probably have never told you before. Sometimes God's tripping. That's right. He is gone. He's a far off. I, I, let me explain what I'm trying to tell you. The whole gist of Matthew 25, 14 through 30 is to give us this parable of the kingdom of God. And it talks about these men who take what they have in potential and they develop that potential. They multiply it. The kingdom of God is that way. What God has put in your hands, you can grow it. You can develop it. You have the capacity to do it. And God knows it. He measured your ability and he's given you things. He's put them in your heart, put them in your life. And then sometimes it seems like he's not around to help you. Well, according to this story, the owner trusted them so much. He went on a faraway trip. That's right. The owner was tripping. He just went far away. Do you know, I was thinking to myself, maybe it's not that God needs to even answer this particular prayer today for me. Maybe he trusts that I have the solution. Maybe he trusts my capacity, my ingenuity, my own wisdom, my own thinking, my own problem solving skills, or my ability to grow something and to multiply it. I think that's the case some of the times. I'm not saying God doesn't answer prayer. I'm not saying God's not with you. I'm not saying God doesn't hear. But I am saying that God trusts you with what he's given to you. So trust yourself. Grow it, multiply it, develop it. And don't think that God's really tripping. He's just on a little trip because he's trusting you.
When social psychologists ask people in a relationship, what's the number one quality you're looking for in someone you're dating? The number one answer wasn't wealth, wasn't sexiness, wasn't good looks, and it wasn't even spirituality. The number one answer was trustworthiness. Hi, I'm Bishop Maldonado. Welcome to Inspiration Moment. Let's talk about trust economics. Do you realize that every community is built and based on trust? Doesn't matter if we're talking about a huge city or a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Everything runs on trust. And I wanna just learn a little bit about how it works and why it's so important. Do you realize that when you're engaging with people, whether it's business or family, marriage, relationships, that in the back of your mind, you're asking trust-based questions like, can I trust you to be there for me? Can I trust you not to cheat on me? Can I trust that you won't put your mother before you put me? Can I trust that you're gonna be hardworking? Can I trust that you're gonna help me pay the bills? Those questions are constantly operating within us. And when that trust is not built and it's eroded, it creates problems for our relationships. So the big question is, how do we build trust? And I've got a simple, quick answer for you. You build trust the way you build a bank account. You make deposits in small gestures, small moments, small things you do to show that person you're there for them. You answer those questions with actions. You become dependable. You become honest. You become consistent because that's what trust is. Dependability, honesty, consistency. When you do that, it's like making deposits in a bank account, except you're making deposits in an emotional account. So I wanna encourage you, start building trust. Thanks for watching, stay inspired. elements of things and to those who beheld him and believed he gave them the power to become what sons of how do you become a son of God because you believe that he is the invisible truth and grace of God come in the flesh well good morning and welcome to Christ International Church online I am Bishop David Maldonado and before we do anything else I want to wish Pastor Tia Maldonado my wife my blessing and gift from God, a very special happy birthday. Her birthday was actually on Friday, her big 45, but we are celebrating all week long and all month long. And so I want you to help me wish her a happy birthday. Amen. I'm so glad you're joining us today uh, for this time of worship. Listen, when we come together, whether it's online or in person, when our hearts come together, filled with faith. There's wonderful things we can experience in God. And so I invite you 
to do just that. Would you participate with us in the worship? Follow along right on your screen. Sing the songs, read the scriptures, pray the prayers, and shout amen as I preach the gospel. And then at the end, we'll share in communion, in, in the celebration of the Eucharist. So please prepare a cup with wine or water right now or and, and also prepare some bread or crackers because at the end of our service we want to celebrate together amen well let's go before the lord right now and just together celebrate who he is and thank him for what he's done amen lord open our lips glory to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever amen Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Let's go in the service and sing to the Lord together. Good morning, CIC. It's such a blessing to be with you this morning. This is Stacey Ariel. Just came to worship with you this morning. Wherever you are, go ahead and lift your hands. Begin to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who reigns on the throne. And I promise you, he has all victory in his hands. So we've got a reason to celebrate. No one can, no one will. Oh, no he standing in the sky. No one can, no one will. Oh, no one will.
A reading from 1 Kings 3, 5 through 12. That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, You were wonderfully kind to my father David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued this great kindness to him today by giving him a son to succeed him. O oh Lord my God, now you have made me king instead of my father David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. 
And here I am among your own chosen people, a nation so great they are too numerous to count. Give me understanding mind so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great nation of yours? The Lord was pleased with Solomon's reply and was glad that he had asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom and governing my people and have not asked for a long life or riches for yourself or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you ask for. I will give you a wise and understanding mind such as no one else has ever had or ever will have. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Psalms 119, verse 129 through 136. Your laws are wonderful. No wonder I obey them. The teaching of your word gives light, so even the simple can understand. I pant with expectation, longing for your commands. Come and show me your mercy, as you do for all who love your name. Guide my steps by your word, so I will not be overcome by evil. Ransom me from the oppression of evil people, then I can obey your commandments. Look upon me with love, teach me your decrees. Rivers of tears gush from my eyes because people disobey your instructions. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Romans 8:26 through 39 And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or endangered or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, who loves us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew 13, verses 31 through 33 and 44 through 52. Glory be to you, Lord Christ. May the Word of the Lord be forever written on our minds, our lips, and our hearts. Here is another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree, and birds come and make nests in its branches. Jesus also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she only put a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. 
The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered in a hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a, like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it up into the shore and sat down and sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. This is the way that it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace, where there will, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you understand all these things? Yes, they said, we do. Then he, he added, every teacher of religious law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings from his storeroom new gems of truth as well as old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, it's time for us to pray. Would you join me in praying this collect? I'll be pulling from it later on in the sermon. So let us pray with faith and thanksgiving and just trusting the Lord that he hears us when we call on him. And then we'll also take a moment to confess our sins to God individually and collectively. Let's go before the Lord. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The scriptures tell us that he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all sins, all unrighteousness, if we make confession. So I invite you right now where you are, would you bow your head, would you close your eyes, would you make a silent confession where you are to the Lord for sins against him and against others. Let's do that now. Let us pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, words, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your wills and, and walk in your way to the glory of your name, Amen and Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you and forgive you of all your sins through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let him strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you into eternal life. As Bishop in the Lord's Church, I declare over your life that your sins have been absolved in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you thank God for forgiveness right now? Thank him for the blood. Thank Him for His faithfulness to love us, to forgive us, to cleanse us, and trust Him in that today. Amen. It's a beautiful thing. Listen, and now we have peace with God. Everything is good. Peace with God because we're justified by faith. And that's something to celebrate. And that's something to let somebody else know. When we have peace with God, uh, the reason we do this in our service is to now come in the name of Christ to other people and say, The peace of the Lord be with you. And our response is always, and also with you. And what we're doing there is just letting each other know all is well between us and God, between you and God, and also between each other, all is well. Would you share that peace with one another right there on your screen or in the room where you are? Would you share the peace of the Lord? Amen. It's time to offer our gifts to the Lord and give Him our very best. At CIC, we take time to go to the Word of God every Sunday before we do that because we want to give with the right uh, attitude in our heart, with the right motive, and we want to give with wisdom and understanding according to the Word of God 
knowing what the Lord is expecting of us. Would you turn then to your Bibles, to the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 6. I want to read just these verses from you, uh, for you from the Message Bible. And uh, we'll go all the way down from the first one to verse number 7. One day, the guild of prophets came to Elisha and said, You can see that this place where we're living under your leadership is getting cramped. We have no elbow room. Give us permission to go down to the Jordan, which, where each of us will get a log. We'll build a roomier place. Elisha said, Go ahead. One of them said, Please, come along with us. He said, Certainly. He went with them. They came to the Jordan and started chopping down trees. As one of them was felling a timber, his axe head flew off and sank in the river. Oh no, master, he cried out, and it was borrowed. The holy man said, where did it sink? The man showed him the place. He cut off a branch and tossed it at the spot. The axe head floated up. Grab it, he said. The man reached out and took it. It's an interesting little story that we have here in uh, the book of 2 Kings. Um, it's about this prophet Elisha and his school of prophets, or the guild as it says it in the Message Bible. Um, and they have now gone, you heard the story, they've gone to build a roomier place because where they are it is too crowded. And what I need you to understand is that this is during a particular tough time in the economy. If you read the chapters before and after you'll find out. That it wasn't the smoothest of times, which makes sense in the context of the story where it says the axe that he was using was a borrowed item. And um, there they are uh, doing their best to expand. I think a lot of us are in that place, doing our best because we're in a cramped condition. Anybody say amen right there? If you know what I'm talking about, hit the hearts on the screen, send thumbs up, say, yep, that's me. Uh, I know Many of you, if not all of you, know what it feels like to be in a cramped place. Maybe not a physical cramped place, but a financial one, an emotional one, a mental one. Uh, and that's exactly where these men are. They're in a cramped place. So they go, uh, you heard the story, they go to build a roomier place. And in the process, the one um, man loses this axe that he has in his hand. He's down there doing his best. To work hard. He's down there doing what is in his power to do. He's down there cutting down the trees and, 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 and doing uh, his part in the process. And in the process, things go wrong. Again, I think a lot of us know what that's like to be in a cramped place, in an uncomfortable place and time in our life. And then to make the best out of it and push hard and do our very best and do the thing that we know to do and that we can do. And then, and then having done that, you know, trusting and believing God, things still don't work out. The axe head falls off. The very thing you need in order to get the other thing accomplished is lost. Have you been there? I know you have. And I want to encourage someone, someone today who's watching and saying, that is where I'm at right now. I'm not sure what we're going to do. We're at the end of the month. New month is coming, new bills, new challenges, or school year is getting started, or what will I do with my job, or how we're going to cover this and that because of what's happening in our society, in our, in our global um, you know, uh, society, things are falling apart. And in all of this, maybe you have done some extraordinary things to, to try to make it better, and now you might be facing, or perhaps someday you will face, and you'll need to remember this, you're facing this moment where you're doing your best and it falls apart on you. And so what the man does is yell out and um, he lets the prophet know what had just happened. And I love that because letting the prophet know, it, it implies a few things. One, he's being responsible to say, you know, this is what's going on. Two, however, it, it shows some level of trust or hope or seeking for an answer. But he's talking to the right guy. He's talking to the prophet of God. And when the prophet of God steps in the picture, when Elisha steps in, he says, show me, show me where that's at. 
uh, he's able to provide a miracle. Now, if, if that's you, if you're in a cramped place and you're doing your very best and now you've lost even that, I want you to hear this word from the Lord. God is saying, show me where it's fallen apart. Show me where it sank. Tell me exactly what, where it is. What is it that happened? Who was it that you were working with? Tell me the specifics. Call out to God with specifics. The Lord says, point to it, because the very place where it fell is the place where it's going to rise. My God, the very thing that you have lost, God says, I'm going to allow for you to recover. A word from the Lord today for you is, watch me work it out for you. Watch me work it out for you. He grabs uh, a branch from a tree. I mean... You know, any random thing, there's no real big significance. Now, of course, there's a prophetic picture here. The tree, uh, speaking of the cross of Jesus, going into the waters. Waters is symbolic of multitudes and people. And then things that are lost coming back to the surface being found. It talks about redemption. It's really that story. But, but there's something else here as well. And it's that the Lord is, the prophet's using something random. Something that should not deliver that result. And here the prophet is using it. And he's stepping out there in the anointing and power, the authority that God's given him. And people are about to witness. This man specifically is about to witness a miracle. And I believe you're going to witness a miracle. That God can use just anything within your reach. And that God can turn things around for us just like that. Axe heads, steel iron uh, heads of an axe, are, they don't float. They sink. They sink. They do not float to the top. I know it because the scripture says it. I also know it because I watched David Letterman some years ago. If you all were fans of his, you know he had a segment, Will It Sink? Will It Float? They sink. They sink. And yet the man of God moving in the wisdom and the power of God delivers this brother from a situation that could have gotten a lot worse because now he didn't have a way to expand and he had to find some way to recover that and give it back to the person that had helped him and had lent him the very accent. But, but here comes the Lord in his power to make it all work. Listen, the word of God for you today is he's going to help you and turn the situation around. He's going to work it out. And listen to this. He will cause you to recover. Whatever is lost, whatever is sunken, I believe that if you and I go before the Lord, let him know exactly where it is, trust him that God is able to recover it. Just like he's recovered us and recovered our lives and our souls, he's able to recover those things that are important to us as well. Would you trust the Lord? As you give today, put your faith in your giving. As you, as you pay your tithe, as you send uh, uh, your, your very best offering, you're putting faith in your actions, saying, Lord, I'm trusting you, I'm believing you. If you've got nothing to give, it doesn't matter, it's sunk, right? Just call out to the Lord and tell Him where it is. But believe that recovery is coming for you in Jesus' name. Sometimes, in order to recover it, uh, uh, the Lord needs to hear from us, and I'm so glad, I don't know, you know, he uses this branch, um, and you may not have a branch to use, and that doesn't make sense. But we'll use our giving as a branch. We'll use our faith as a branch. We'll use our prayers as a branch. And watch the Lord cause things to recover in our life. Amen? I hope you're encouraged by that word. Amen. Listen, I want you to give today. Be generous to the Lord. If you're unable to, I'm believing God with you in prayer. And I'm believing God with you for that great recovery. But be as generous to the Lord as you can. Use your faith. Use your branch. There's three ways we can give here at CIC. You can text the word CIC give to 77977. And just put the amount there and send it forward. If you've done it in the past and need to reset your uh, card, you want to use a different account, different card, send the word reset to the very same number and you can start over. Uh, also, we can give by clicking on the link that's on the screen more than likely from where you're watching. If you're participating in the active uh, live video and there's uh, or if you look in the comment section, someone from the ministry team will post a link. Uh, called Push Pay for CIC, and you can click that, and it'll allow you to give. And then finally, you can always go to CIC, Orlando.org, and give there. Whatever you do, give by faith, trusting God for recovery today.
Pastor Tia. I'm here with the Serrano crew. And we're here to wish you a very happy birthday. But before we do that, your number one fan of Storytime has a joke he wants to tell you. Me. Knock, knock. Who's there? Oh, um, Mom. Um, 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 Pastor Tia. Pastor Tia who? Oh, uh, a joke. <laughs> well, Pastor Tia, we want to wish you a happy birthday. You ready, guys? Yeah. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Pastor Tia. cheeks all these years <laughs> and just thank you for being my pastor it's been a blessing happy birthday pastor tia we celebrate another another year of life with you it is an honor it is uh, just a day of celebration for you enjoy your day may the peace of the lord always be with you and satisfy you with very long life and like Ari said save me some cake please i love you Amen. Happy birthday, Pastora Tia. We are excited to see another year to celebrate with you. And I'm just excited to see you fulfilling your priestly duties. And we're just so overwhelmed with joy to see you laughing and just pouring into each and one of us. So thank you. And we hope you enjoy your birthday. And yes, save me some banana pudding. Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday, Pastor Tia. It's been about a million years since I've seen you last and I miss your face. I hope this birthday and the next 45 plus are everything you hope and wish they would be. Love you. Well, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Pastor Tia. We We're so excited. Love you so much. <laughs> yes, we want to celebrate you on this uh, special day. Surprise, surprise. Surprise. <laughs> you're a blessing. You're, you're special to uh, Christ International Church. You're special to the CIF Network. And you're special uh, to us uh, individually uh, as a husband and wife. And you're special to uh our church, Aspen Community Church. So we wanted to say thank you. We appreciate all that you do uh, for us and for uh, Bishop. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your day. The Bible says that, uh, behold, I will give you pastors after my own heart. And uh, God has truly given us a pastor, even though we may be pastors, but God has given us pastors after his heart. And so we thank God for you and Bishop, but especially uh, we're shouting out to you today on your very special day. Happy birthday, and we wish you many, many more. Yes. Take care. God bless. Love you. See you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to, to you. you. Happy birthday, Pastor Tia. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Happy birthday. Happy birthday.
International Church in Orlando, Florida. This is your servant, Pastora Gloria. Dios me lo bendiga a todo. God bless you all my saints. I was told a few minutes, a few weeks ago, I mean, that it was going to be Pastor Tia's birthday. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Did you know, I've been practicing my English because, you know, my English is not very good looking. But I hope that you can understand me. Pastora Tia, happy birthday for the cumpleaños. I wish I could be with you, but you know, I always want to be with you guys. But I can't do to this COVID-19. Yo estoy cuarentín. I cannot go anywhere because I'm a senior citizen. But I am so excited for you, Pastora. Oh, I can remember when I was 27 years old too. Oh, it was such a beautiful time. My hair was black. I didn't have a lot of wrinkles, but I'm still beautiful. Hallelujah. I just thank God for this opportunity that he's given me to wish you a beautiful happy birthday. May God give you so many long years of life. God bless you. And I love you to hear from New York. Miss Pastora Gloria at your service. God bless you. Happy birthday. Let's give the Lord all of our attention at this moment. Let's pay close ear and hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. I want to minister to you uh, in, from, for the next few moments from the text here in Romans chapter 8. Would you follow me? It was in our readings earlier, but I'm going to go ahead and read it once more. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, and we'll read all the way down uh, through into verse number 38. Romans chapter 8 verse number 26, and it reads, I'm reading from the uh, New Living Translation, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. For God knew His people in advance, and He chose them to become like His Son, so that His Son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, He called them to come to Him. And having called them, He gave them right standing with Himself. And having given them right standing... He gave them His glory. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since He did not spare even His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, won't He also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for His own? No one, for God Himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted? or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death? As the scripture says, For your sake we are killed every day, we are being, being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, Neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Amen and amen. I want to speak to you just for a few moments and, and, and give you a word from the Lord, encourage you, strengthen you, and instruct you. Uh, based on this subject right here, I'm convinced. I am convinced. I'm just 
convinced. Uh, that's what it says here in the New Living Translation in verse 38. If you, if you got a King James familiarity with the scripture, it says, For I am persuaded. Uh, the NIV, like this one, says, I'm convinced. The ESV says, For I am sure. I am sure. You know, the church at Rome was going through some situations. Uh, verse 35 describes some of it. Uh, they're going through trouble, calamity, persecution, hunger, destitution, danger, threatens, uh, threatenings against their life for their faith, for what they were doing as a Christian community and who they were believing in, uh, and, and simply because life has a lot of hardship attached to it. They were going through some situations, as well as many other churches, uh, in, 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 the, in the era and in the time where Paul is writing. And so these words are a blessing for all of us. Paul is writing to them, and throughout the book of Romans, he has done a phenomenal job to explain doctrine and faith in Christ Jesus, to explain what it means to live in the Spirit. And in chapter number 7, he talks about the war that's waging within us every day between the Spirit and the flesh. And then he starts off in chapter number 8 saying there's no condemnation in Christ and telling us how to walk in the Spirit. And, and then he starts getting into this subject about difficulties and troubles in life and how God helps us. And in these verses that we've just read, he's doing just that. He's giving us proof, he's giving us evidence, and giving us confidence in God's ability to help us get through situations. And so what I want to do is I want us to focus on these things that he points out to us in these verses. As a matter of fact, in our collect today, when we prayed earlier in the service, we ask God to help us with these things. We, we said in our prayer, God is our protector. We said that we put our trust in him and we asked him to increase upon us and multiply his mercies for us because we don't always get it right. And sometimes we're struggling from within when we're struggling with everything in life. So we're asking for Christ's mercy. We're asking for his protection. We're asking for his help. And then we said something really specific in the prayer. Did you pay attention to that? We said, so that we could pass through things temporal. So I can get through these temporary situations without losing anything eternal. The worst thing you can do is get so caught up with the issues of life that you forget about the things that really matter, those things that are from above, those things that come from the Lord. That's the absolute worst thing you can do is to get caught up in those type situations. And so I want to encourage you today, um, and I want to share with you some words that Paul shares with us about where our focus is needs to be uh, and, and, and what we need to do in order to get through these times. It's really important that um, you walk away with this understanding because when the challenging time comes, you need to focus, focus, focus. Put all of your attention on what God is saying, on what Christ has done, on what the Spirit is doing. It's important for us to have an eternal mindset, a spiritual mindset, not to lose eternal and spiritual things over temporal and earthly things. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote uh, to the church at Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 2, and he told them, think about things of heaven, not the things of the earth, right? If then you're in Christ Jesus, uh, you have this new life, then put your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. And you say, well, why, why is that? Don't focus on the earthly. It doesn't mean you can't pay attention to what's going on in the world around you. But is that your focus, your heart is not on these things, okay? And I'm going to tell you the, the, the primary reason why. Because everything in earth, hear me carefully, everything in this earth, creation itself, all mankind, and everything that happens in between, has been damaged by sin. That's right, it's been damaged by sin. If you read the chapters prior to chapter 8, read chapter 3, 4, 5, and 6, and 7, you will find out that Paul is explaining to the church how the original sin of Adam opened the door for corruption to come into creation and into humanity and how sin is constantly damaging and destroying everything beautiful that God has created, including you and me, including this world. And so our focus needs to be on Jesus. Our focus needs to be on things above because Jesus comes to restore 
those damaged things. Jesus comes to rebuild it. Jesus comes to reestablish the glory and the beauty of God in all of creation and in our lives, right? So we'll focus on Jesus and what he does. We'll focus on how he's overcome uh, through the cross and his resurrection. We'll focus on how Jesus overcame the world and overcame temptation and overcame sin and how because of what he's done and because of our faith in him, how we can participate in the recovery, in the strength, in the renewal. We talked about the recovery during offering time. I showed you how the stick in the water that recovered the axe head is a picture of Christ, the cross, coming into the multitude, the world that is covered with water, and how things that are lost are recovered. We prayed about it in our colleague, and now here we are in the Word again, uh, and Paul is exhorting us to the spiritual things and, and to those things that Christ has done. So there's corruption all around. There's corruption everywhere, and, and, and let me just tell you why this is so important, because on a daily basis, there is a huge challenge for every Christian on a daily basis to focus on the spiritual and the eternal, um, because the corruption all around us really wears us out. It really works on us constantly, nonstop. Sin is constantly working and provoking you and moving against you. Everything you pray for, everything you want, everything you desire, everything you experience, corruption is working against it. And it's a daily struggle. So what I want to do, because we're in a constant struggle, because we need to resist that corruption, what I want to do is I want us to, to really look at two things. Look at where the corruption is coming from and then know what Paul is showing us in this chapter so that we can overcome as well and we can keep our thing, our, our mind on Christ. Let me first of all give you four areas where corruption has really uh, come to and it's really affecting us. Four areas where corruption is coming against your life. Uh, and here's the first one. It comes from the world around us. It comes from the world around us. Think about the godless culture we live in. How people don't even think about God. How, how, how the world would make you doubt Christ. How, how, how the world is not set up to honor God. Think about uh, the human suffering that, that you can turn everywhere. You can't, you can't even watch a television commercial without someone showing you more human suffering. Can't watch the news. Can't, you can't look. And there's every city, every state, every country, every part of the world, every corner of the world is experiencing human suffering. And that suffering comes from the corruption. Think about the financial pressures that are constantly showing their face. Think about... Uh, all types of social illness and injustices that are around us. It's, it, you can come up with a whole list of things just thinking about the social illness and injustices around us. All of it is a sign of bad news. All of it is a sign of corruption and sin working against humanity, working against creation. Even the corruption in the ecosystems, right? The ecosystems, even even the, the global uh, uh, warming and uh, climate crisis that we are facing, all creation is affected by the corruption in the world. So it's, it's coming from the world around us. It's all around us, so you're going to face it every day. You're going to face it every day. And it's, gonna try, it's, com it's coming to distract you from what Christ has. If you're not careful, you'll be caught up in it. It also comes, number two, from people, from our interaction with people. right? Because when you deal with people, at some point in life, in those relationships, in those interactions, you're going to struggle against corruption. You say, how so? Through persecution, for what you believe, for what you stand for. You may experience persecution. i got a whole list here, so let me just read it to you. Uh, people, people will end up uh, being a, a blessing sometimes and a curse and other times. To be honest with you, those interactions get hard. Why? Because corruption is working, and you run into haters. You run into fakers. You run into gossipers. <laughs> you run into ill-willed family members and friends. They really don't want anything good for you. They're just there acting as if. 
Uh, you run into liars. Come on, y'all, y'all, y'all got to testify on the screen right now and, and let other people know. If, if this has been your experience, let them know true. Haters, fakers, gossipers, ill will people, liars. There's abusers in life. You're, you mean all the right things and all the good things, and you don't realize other people are taking advantage and abusing you. They're manipulators. There are scavengers in this life, in relationships. There are deceitful people. Yeah, I was talking to one Christian uh, not long ago, and they said, well, you know, I made this confession my own self, honestly. But I was talking to them, sharing with them how I used to feel that way. I, I couldn't find anyone that, hey, I don't have any enemies. I couldn't tell that anyone hated me. I was too naive. I was too naive, thinking, oh, everyone is lovely, everyone is beautiful, everyone is will, everyone's will for me is good. I was too naive. But when you grow up and when you taste life real, you find out that people are scavengers, they're deceitful, people can be greedy. People can be freeloaders and use you. People can uh, bring foolish influence into your life. And people who think they're a blessing to you sometimes, in reality they're not. And sometimes they don't even know it. And so uh, I'm telling you that corruption is in the world around us. And it's in the relationships that we interact with. Here's number three. Corruption is experienced and resists us through the devil himself. And through spiritual wickedness. What do you mean by that, Bishop? Well, there's such thing as demonic oppression and demonic influence. That if, if the world and the sin in it, and if the relationships and the corruption in it were not enough, there are demons against you and I. The Bible talks about that very clearly. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't struggle against that. We struggle against uh, spiritual wickedness, demons, uh, Powers in high places. It, it is a very true reality. Uh, there's temptation that comes against you and me. Evil desires. Satanic strategies. Satan you say, I don't believe that the devil has strategies against me. Oh yes, he, oh, yes, he does. John chapter 10, Jesus said it. That the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, but I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. So there are satanic strategies to kill us. To kill what God has given us. To, to, to dissuade us. Paul writes about it one time when he told the Thessalonian church. I tried to come and see you, but the devil uh, resisted us. He was there holding us back. We finally got the breakthrough on it. So sometimes what's going on is just straight up demonic. It's straight up from hell. It's the, it's the spirits of evil that are coming up against you. Trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And then, and then speaking of the devil and spiritual wickedness. There's just wickedness in High places, darkness in every type of form. It's another thing we're struggling against. The wickedness, the devil himself. The people and the interactions, the world and its fallen corruption, its fallen condition of corruption. And then if that weren't enough, you got feelings from within. You got yourself to deal with, right? It's what Paul says in chapter 7 of Romans, that I realize that even when I want to do good, evil is present. Because good and evil both reside in me. The law of God is in my heart, but evil is in my flesh. And so I got God's will in me, and I got my own will in me, and they're constantly going head, uh, headbutting and going against each other. So there's uh, corruption from the world, corruptions from our interactions with people, corruption from the devil and spiritual wickedness, and then, and then we're struggling against the very feelings from within. Let me explain to you what I mean, just to add on a little bit. We constantly battle against things that are coming from within, that are the byproducts of sin. Whether it's the sin itself that you keep entangling yourself with, and you keep uh, repeating behaviors that are sinful, or it's the byproduct of your past sins, or even someone else's past sin. Uh, let me explain what I mean. You deal with the byproducts that look like this. Depression. Anxiety, fear, rejection, guilt, shame. Those are all byproducts or sin itself. Self-centeredness, pride, arrogance, anger, lust, strife, filthy thoughts. You might be going, oh, wait, wait, I, I, oh, don't, no, that ain't me, that, oh, got me. Yeah, that's how you're probably feeling right now with this list. And I'm not done. Low self-esteem, laziness, gluttony, self-ambition. 
And you could probably add a whole bunch more to this because there's countless other ways in which sin, its power of corruption, has eroded us from within and we struggle with that. Things from within, things from without. So, how's that make you feel? Pretty hopeless probably, right? It, it makes you realize I'm not the only one, you know. I had a conversation just a few weeks ago and I said, I said to the person, listen, I have never proclaim myself to be perfect. I know I struggle. And I know everyone else around me does. I have really clear uh, understanding of my own fallenness and my need for Jesus and for His grace and His love and His mercy. I hope you do too. So listen, Paul is trying to help the church, telling them about what God will do for them and how God's going to keep them. But he first, you know, has to uh, help us in the earlier chapters, showing us how, how corruption and sin have entered in the world. And now he's about to offer hope. Before I get to this next list where, where Paul is saying focus on these things, let, let me tell you why it's important to focus. And again, remember, our sermon subject is, I'm convinced. I'm convinced of what God wants for me. And sometimes it's hard to feel convinced because you're dealing with all this stuff that I just mentioned to you that I just listed. And, and those things come and make you feel a different way, make you think of a different way. So it's very important. If you want to walk in faith, you want to grow in Christ, you want to develop yourself in the Spirit, it's important that you become convinced of what God says that He has done and provided for you, of what Christ says and what Christ does for you and for me. As a matter of fact, it is uh, St. Augustine who speaks to us and he tells us that we have to have a full conviction of about what we know about Jesus. Don't let anything come and steal from you what we know about Jesus. Because all of those things coming against you are coming to take from you what Christ has done for you in your own knowledge. And the minute you start doubting that, your faith is weak and you can get caught up in that corruption. So I want to help you. In, in uh, St. Augustine's commentary on the book of Romans, he shares with us some words Particularly, he's, uh, uh, I'll just focus in on this one. He talks about Paul's words in verse 38 when Paul says, I am persuaded, where I'm using the word today, I'm convinced. I'm persuaded nothing's going to separate me from the love of Christ. And this is, this is what uh, St. Augustine says. He says, I am certain, says the apostle. And not simply, I think. It's not this that I think. That is to say that his faith gives him a full conviction. When Paul says, I am certain, Augustine is saying his faith gave him a full conviction that neither the threat of death, whatever is, nor the promise of the present life, nor any of the things which he enumerates cannot separate from the love of God the one who believes in him. Nothing present, nothing coming, nothing from the past can separate us from what God has for you and for me. No matter what it is and what we're dealing with, nothing is going to break that thing up. You have to be convinced. You have to be like Paul and say, I am certain, I am, I am persuaded. Uh, Augustine says you have to have and hold a full conviction in your heart concerning what Christ has done. And so what I want to do is I'm going to lay out for you in the next few minutes um, things that you and I need to be considering. If we're not going to put our things, our mind on the things of the earth, we're going to put our mind on the things of heaven, the things of the Spirit, the things that Christ has done for us. I'm going to give us a list for us to consider so that we can be convinced, so that our faith can be fully convicted. Things that we have in Christ that help us in our conviction of, uh, for this spiritual truth and so we can walk in what the Lord says. Notice now, in chapter 8, in the verses we read, I'm going to pull out some things for us to notice, that Paul is giving a defense against all of those pressures that are coming against us. And he's trying to help the saints in Rome who are going through, I told you verse 35, they're going through this, that, and the other. And now he's trying to help them. Notice that back in verse 26, he started off saying that the Holy Spirit helps us. That's, that's our first point here. I'm going to give you seven, seven points of these things that Paul says we need to, we need to understand and realize so that our faith is convinced, so that we are persuaded. All right. Here's the first one. The Holy Spirit helps us. Back in verse 26, he says that he prays with us. So when you pray, you're not alone. The Holy Spirit is praying with us. He says, what we can't say in our own words what we have trouble and difficulty trying to even put into words and express that the Holy Spirit takes those 
groanings and moanings, the pain, the anguish, the confusion, the stress, the anxiety, wherever that moaning and that groaning is coming for, I have no words for it. He says the Holy Spirit's going to take it and he's going to make it effective. He's going to make it an effective plea before God. He's going to use it to pray with us to the Father. That's amazing. God knows that we're so messed up and so weak and we need so much help in this world that he sends us his spirit so that his spirit can help us how to pray. Isn't that amazing? That's a wonderful thing God does. He pleads for us in harmony with God's will for our life. Because sometimes we don't even know, God, I don't even know what your will is for me right now. What's going on in my life? And the Holy Spirit begins to pray for us even when we can't come up with the words. That's number one. Come on, let's go on to verse uh, to, to number two. Verse 28. Verse 28 is a very famous verse, right? I know God is working all things out uh, for my good, you know, for those who, are, who love him and are called according to his purpose. So, so put this down for the second one in verse 28. God is working it out. I said it during the offering time. I'm going to say it right now. God is working it out. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost just when I say that right there. God is working it out. I don't know what you're dealing with, but I hear God saying, let them know, David, God is working it out. You say, what do you mean by that? That he is truly causing the circumstances that are adversarial to us to become co-workers with us in his plans and his purposes for our life. I'm going to say it again, that he is truly causing the circumstances that are adversarial to us to become co-workers in his plan and his purpose for our life. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, when, when the Bible says that all things work together for good, that, that word there uh, uh, for working together, that, that expression comes from the Greek word synergio. It's where we get the English word synergy. You know, synergy happens when not when one thing is working, but when two things are working together, two things create a synergy. An energy comes from it called synergy. Synergeo in the Greek means to be a fellow worker, a co worker is what it really means. It means to co operate. You're not operating alone. God says, I've sent help. You say, what help are you sending me? The Holy Ghost? Well, that's one way. The second thing I'm sending is the very circumstances you're complaining about. The very things that is hurting you. The very things that are stressing you out. God says, if you're in Christ, if I love you and you love me and you're called to my purposes, trust me, I'm going to use those things as a co-worker, as a co-operator in your life. It means to help work with something. It means to work Together, So God is working together for good. It becomes your assistant. The very thing that is meant to harm you becomes your assistant. It reminds me of Joseph's words, right? Because the, the, the book of Genesis gives us uh, Joseph's version of what Paul was saying. When he looked at his brothers who had sold them off into slavery and gotten rid of him, they actually helped him get to the place where he was supposed to be. And later in life, when they're reunited, Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Actually, your decision to sell me, you were actually assisting me. You gave me an assist. Do you know what an assist is in basketball? It's when you have the ball and instead of scoring yourself, you pass it off to someone else and that person scores. That means you are accredited or you're credited for what that person did. You got an assist. And I got a word from the Lord. God says life is giving you an assist. The circumstances you're going through right now, they're giving you an assist. Come on, somebody. Hear me right now. I hope by faith you catch an alley-oop and you dunk on life right now. I hope by faith you hear me. Don't run from it. Don't be afraid of it. As it's being passed to you, Catch it and understand that this thing that's coming at me is not coming to hurt me and destroy me. It's coming to assist me in the purposes of God. My God, when he says I'm working all things together for your good, you need to believe that God is saying, for them that love God, God is co-working, providing all things for good so that it goes well with them. God is giving you synergy, synergy in the midst of this situation. Come on, number three. My Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost. Whoa, I wish I had a, 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 a musician and I wish I had you to dance because you know I don't dance too well. But come on, somebody. I feel God right now. I feel God when I'm saying this to you. God is saying I'm here and I'm giving you an assist. It will destroy somebody else. 
somebody else who's not in the, my purposes, who's not in the game on my team, it'll hurt them. But for you, it will be an assist. Number one, the Holy Spirit helps us. Number two, God is working it out. Number three, notice what it says, that God has foreknowledge. He has foreknowledge of the things that are happening to us right now. If you go back with me, look at, look at verse number 29. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. God has foreknowledge. So let me help you understand this. He is sovereign. Do you know what sovereignty is? You know what sovereignty means? It means that he has and expresses supreme authority. No one has authority over him. He has all the authority. He has full control of everything. And he is sovereign in his power. He is sovereign in his knowledge. He is sovereign in his design of your life, my life. And this entire world. This corruption thing I'm talking about in the creation and in, in the interactions with people. This corruption that the devil comes against us and works with us. None of it surprises him. It's not catching him off guard. He is in absolute control of everything. He's going to work those things together for good. Nothing surprises God. He has foreknowledge. Nothing surprises him. He knows in advance. He's the great one. Come on, somebody. He's actually the, the, the chief coordinator of it all. You say, well, you mean God sent this to me? Even if God didn't send it, he'll use it. He knows how to coordinate that at the end of the day, everything works according to his purposes because he knows ahead of time. He knows ahead of time what you and I will be dealing with. Look at what the Message Bible says. I'm going to read the verse to you from the Message Bible. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lies, lines as the life of his son. I'll say that part again. He decided from the outset to shape the lives, because that's what these situations are doing. They're shaping your life. To shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity that he restored. We see the original an intended shape of our lives there in Him. When you look at Christ, right? The scripture says that He foreknew. Uh, for those of us who are called according to His purposes and, and we're called to be in His likeness, to be like His Son. Notice what the verse is saying. It's not just saying God knows situations before they happen and so He'll coordinate everything. It's not just that. It's that God foreknew. He, he saw what was coming and what He did was He used the circumstances... Uh, to shape and form Jesus, right? The scripture says in the book of Philippians that Jesus was obedient to the Father, even to the point of death, okay? So Jesus experiences all our feelings, all of our pains, all of our struggles, all of the stuff that you and I feel he's felt, right? And then God used it in Christ to, to, to restore what Adam and all the people after Adam had lost, through sin, corruption comes in and destroys us and destroys everything. And Christ doesn't cave into the sin. He overcomes it. He overcomes the world. He overcomes death. He overcomes corruption. Right? And then and, and he shows us the perfect image of someone who is a human being in the full image of God. That's who Jesus is, right? He comes fully in the flesh, fully man, and fully God. And so God says, look, I gave you my son so that he would be the first of many sons, so that he would be the first of many daughters, so that he would be the first of all of you who were going to follow, putting your trust in him, putting your faith in me. I gave you an example. And so what I'm doing is I'm using this because I'm sovereign and I'm supreme in my knowledge and my power, and I know what's coming before it comes. I'm using all of these circumstances, watch this, to shape your life. It's not just that God knows. But it's that God's shaping. When we talk about the foreknowledge of God, know that God says, I know what I'm doing. I'm shaping you. Trust me in this thing. I know what I'm doing. Come on, let's go to the fourth one here. Number one, the Holy Spirit helps. Number two, God's working it out. Number three, God has foreknowledge. Here's number four. He chose and called us. He chose and he called us. Notice what the scripture tells us here that... Uh, 
he knew already what was coming. He knew what was going to be, uh, our, what our life was going to be involved in. And then look at verse 29 again. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him, right? And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. So let's break those things down about his calling and why and what he's doing. Not only is God uh, having the foreknowledge of our life and our circumstances, but he chose us and he called us. Do you know what it means to be called? You know, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, you should know your calling do you know what it means to be called? All over the New Testament, in the epistles, they speak of a God who has listened um, uh, to humanity, responded with Christ, and now Christ gives us the gospel, the good news goes forth, and we listen to the gospel, we listen to God's voice, we listen to God's response to our cry and our need, and God is saying the gospel is calling you to a life restored, to overcome this world and the corruption. And so those who are serving Christ, we've enlisted our lives for Jesus because we heard the call in the gospel. We're called because we have heard a calling from God. In, in the scriptures, the word calling here in the Greek is the word kaleo. And kaleo means several different things throughout scripture. So let me break it down to you really quickly. It means to call out loud. Like when uh, Jesus talks about his sheep in John 10 and 3. And he says, my sheep, what? Know my voice. They hear my voice. They respond because I call them out loud. It's used of Jesus when, uh, remember in the, the gospels, when he calls out to his disciples and he says, come and follow me. They heard his voice. That's the word kaleo. But here's another way. Metaphorically, it means to cause to pass from one state to another. So it's calling out from. I'm going to move you from one place to another place. What does that make you think of? Of course, First Peter 2 and 9. He called us out the darkness into his marvelous life. So when, when the Bible says that you're called, you're chosen, it's because you heard his voice, you responded to him like the disciples that came, like the sheep that know his voice. That you heard his call and he's moving you from darkness into light. That Like, like uh, Abraham, in Hebrews 11 and 8, it says that God called Abraham out from where he was to a different place that he would receive as an inheritance. God's trying to move you into a different place of life. Move you into a different state of reality and existence with him. Respond to the call of the Lord. Here's the third thing really quickly. Uh, it means to invite someone. When God is calling, it's, it's really talking about inviting someone metaphorically. Uh, and so God is saying, I'm, I'm calling men to me through the gospel to be to invite them into this life. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.14 talks about that. And I won't go through all the verses, but here's another one. Uh, it means to give a name. When God calls, he's giving you a name. He's giving you a character. He's giving you a, a new life. So when you're called, he's giving you a new name and a new character. And finally, it means to salute you, to greet you and welcome you. This is what God is saying. I called you. So you think that all this stuff you're struggling with in your own heart and in your life, you, you're falling apart with guilt and shame and hurt and anger and frustration and depression. Don't fall apart. You're called. I've called you to be in relationship with me. I've given you a new name. I've invited you into something. Don't forget that. I have called you, come on someone, to come out of there and pass over to this new place. I have called you, says the Lord, and you can hear my voice because you are my sheep. I've called you. There's a calling in the gospel. Hallelujah. And then, and watch this. He calls us. He chooses us and calls us. That's how he chooses us. He calls us. Like he chose the 12. He called them. Right? Through the gospel, through my preaching right now, God is calling you to himself. So you can transition from the life you've known to the glorious life in Jesus. Well, here's another blessing. So you don't fall apart with the pressure and the struggles of life. Come on. I'm trying to get somebody to believe this word. I'm trying to help you to be convinced about what God has done for you. Listen, the Holy Spirit is helping you. Be convinced Jesus is with you. Come on. God is working it out. Synergio. He has foreknowledge. He has chosen and called us. 
Your life ain't about to fall apart anytime soon. Believe this. Be convinced. Hallelujah. Here, here goes another one because uh, we got to go. He justifies us. The scripture we read says he puts us in right standing. He calls and chooses us and puts us in right standing with him. Uh, uh, the message Bible says after God made that decision of what his children should be like that he called and he chose us. After he made that decision, he followed it up by calling people by name. He called us and gave us a name. He chose us. After he called them by name, he set them on solid basis with himself. That's what the Message Bible says. He puts you in right standing, solid basis. Listen, you have nothing to be afraid of when it comes to the Father and God. He loves you just as you are. You have nothing to be nervous about. You have nothing to keep doubting. Am I good enough for God or not? Will he like me or not today? Will he hear me or not? Of course, he absolutely loves you. He gave you your name. He chose you. He foreknew you. Come on, somebody. He's giving you his spirit to help you with stuff you can't even figure out. This is who God is. Hallelujah. Remember, we were talking about all those struggles? Those struggles. Well, the good news is those struggles, those things, whether it's from the world, from people, from the devil, from yourself, wherever your issues come from, those things do not get to define you and me. They don't get to define us. They cannot. Those issues cannot distort God's understanding about who we are. It cannot distort God's understanding about who we are. It might mess with you and me from time to time. You wake up and you feel that oppression, you feel that depression, you feel the anxiety, you got the fear, you're so nervous about what the doctor might say, you're so afraid about what your children might do or what's going to happen because I messed up this way, am I going to lose it all? You know, and all that gets to your mind at some point. Listen, God is saying none of that is messing me up. I know exactly who you are. I gave you your name. I called you. I'm with you. I've given you my spirit. I've given you my love. Nothing's going to set separate you from me. My God, that's what I want you to be convinced about right now. I know we're going through tough times, but be convinced that God is with you. It messes with our minds at times, but let me tell you, it cannot convince God of anything else. God is already convinced about who we are in him because the son, his son, Jesus made us to be who we are. And there's no lies between Jesus and the father. There's no lies between the father and the son. There's no doubt about what the one has done and what the other has approved. He is convinced about who Jesus makes you and me to be. Jesus has given us his own perfection. Hallelujah. He's given us his own beauty. The Bible says he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. He gives us what we couldn't get for ourselves. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus does. Holiness Perfection, beauty is not something you and I work our way into. It is a gift from God. It comes by His grace. It's not something we earn through our hard work. Be convinced about this. That you are exactly who God wants you to be. Yeah, are there areas you need to grow up in? Are there areas you need to develop? Are there areas you need to repent for? Absolutely. But none of those things are things that God didn't already foresee. He is working circumstances in your life to keep perfecting you and developing you in Him. Hallelujah. And then I'm, I'm going to give you this, this one, uh, uh, one last one. Here's number seven. Here's number seven. He gives us His glory. Let me, let me, let me review with you because I'm going to wrap this up right here. Number one, the Holy Spirit helps us. Number two, God is working it out. Number three, God has foreknowledge. Number four, he chose and he called us. Hallelujah. Number five, he justifies us. Number six, I'm sorry I said seven. Number six, he gives us his glory. He gives us his glory, y'all. His glory, you say, what does it mean when it says he gives us his glory? L listen to the verse again. I'll read it to you this time from the Message Bible, verse 29 and verse 30. And then after getting them established, giving them right standing, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun. That's amazing. His glory, when, when, when we talk about the glory of God and the glory of Jesus that we have received, he's put his spirit in us. His glory is his presence. His glory is all the things that are awesome, the all things. You don't have words to express how amazing it is. That is the weight and the beauty of his glory. He put all of that in us because he gives us himself. He is the only glorious one. But because he's united himself to us, he stays with us. 
He's given us His glory. Ain't that amazing? That God says, I know what you're going through, and I know the stuff you struggle against, but guess what? I ain't going nowhere. I am with you, and because I stay with you, I have my glory in your life. I've made my, my, my resting place in you. It's what Ephesians says, that we're being built up to be a temple for the Lord so that His Spirit would rest in us. Our, our, our bodies are temples for the Holy Spirit. He's in us. So nothing can separate us from Him. Nothing can separate us from His love. You know why? Because there's an unbreakable bond between God and us. You can't, you can't break that. You can't, you can't, it can't happen. One time Jesus prayed and He says, Father, uh, the enemy can't snatch one soul out of my hand that I've got in my hand. Can't snatch him. There's nothing that's going to break you and separate you from what he has intended and he loves. And you have heard the call of the gospel. You have responded. That's it. It's a bond. It's not going to be broken. Nothing can separate us from God's love. So today, no matter what you're facing, no matter where the struggle is, no matter where the pressure is coming from, no matter what is going on in your life, I want you to remember these seven things. Last time, number one, the Holy Spirit is helping us. He ain't going nowhere. He's helping us. Number two, God is working it out some way, somehow. He is using this thing because number three, he has foreknowledge. Nothing is surprising God. Nothing is catching him off guard. Number four, he chose and called us in his foreknowledge. He gave us a name. He made us who we are. Number five, he justified us on the cross and in the resurrection of Jesus. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. He has justified us with everything that Jesus has already done for us. It's a done deal. Now you and I get to play that thing out for the rest of our lives. He continues to justify and perfect us. Isn't that amazing? Number six, in that process, he stays with us and he gives us his glory. And here's number seven. You say, what's number seven? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. I am persuaded, my God, I am convinced that no matter how things go down, no matter if it's a good day for me or a bad day for me, no matter if life is on my side or against me, no matter where I'm at, if my family's on a high or it's on a low, if my finances are well or not, if my days are, are getting tougher or not, it doesn't matter. God is with me. He's not leaving me. Nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not life, not death, not things above, not things below. No angels, no demons. Come on. Nothing that has been been, has been in the past, is in the present, or ever will be, nothing, not a height, not a depth, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus has set his mark on us. God has set his eyes on us. He is doing the work, and he will not give up. He refuses to break that bond and break his promise for us. My God, I want you to know God's working stuff out for you. My Lord, I want you to know that whatever you're going through, he says, come on and let me know. Let me know what's going on because I want to show you how. I want to show you how I'm going to work in your life. I need you to be convinced today of the goodness of Jesus, of all that he's done for you. Oh, for you. Come on, somebody. I just thought about that, right? Uh, 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 we would start that and say that in church back in the day. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I wish you would cry out hallelujah today and say, I'm convinced, I'm convinced, I'm convinced in Jesus' name, I'm convinced. My God, that is good news. Share this word with somebody. Share the good news with somebody. Watch it again later on this week or whenever you may not feel so convinced. Keep your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. Let us be persuaded. Amen, amen, and amen. It's time to celebrate the Lord at the table and thank God for all that he's done through Jesus Christ. So would you pray with me? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels 
and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Would you say it with me, church? Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your one and only eternal son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and he offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. And on the night he was handed to he was handed over to suffering and death. The Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, "Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you." Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Let us say that together once more. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. I'll ask you now where you are to stretch your hands over the cup and over the bread, and let us pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come, that he would, by his power and his glory, transform this into the very body and blood of our Lord, that this would be nourishment for our souls, healing and strength for our bodies, power from on high for our lives. Let us pray together. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection and ascension, we offer you these gifts, with these gifts, Lord. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and the blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of a new and unending life in Him, and sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into your joy, the, into the joy of your eternal kingdom. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, your Son, Amen. Now let us pray as the Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. I'm breaking the bread here. You may break the bread at home and then you'll eat after I've eaten and drinking and you'll be able to eat as well. See, I see a miracle has happened. Hallelujah. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them and remember that Christ has died for you. Believe what you see, see what you believe, and become what you are, the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And I believe. Hallelujah. And this is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. I believe. Would you eat where you are and drink where you are with faith, believing as I continue to eat here?
This is a sacramental act. We believe there's no separation between God and everything he created. This he created. These are physical things. But he's here in the midst of it. Supernaturally. Hallelujah. And we receive from him redemption, power, strength, healing for our lives. We celebrate and thank God for Jesus. He said, this is my body and we believe him today. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm reminded of the book of 1 Corinthians. I tell it all the time. Chapter number 10, where Paul's writing to the church and he's saying, for those who are reasonable, I ask a question. When we drink of this cup that we bless, is it not the blood of the Lord Jesus? The answer is yes. And then he says, and when we eat of this bread, is it not the body of Christ? He says, we say yes. And then he tells us what happens. He says, because the many of us become one when we eat of this bread. All of us become one. Here we are united. This is the sacrament of miracles, the sacrament of unity, the sacrament where we are united to Christ and to one another. And that's why we celebrate week after week. Let us pray and give thanks to God for this meal and this time of worship we have received. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us your spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Just before we say goodbye, let me remind you to please share this video with family and friends. Let it be a blessing for someone. Also, take a moment if you haven't done so already and be generous to the work of the Lord and give in worship as an offering to the Lord. Amen. Also, remember, every Wednesday we meet for Bible study on Facebook. Uh, look for Christ International Church on Facebook or come to Pastor Tia and mine's personal page. You'll find us there. It's a very interactive Bible study. Every Monday through Friday, there is an episode at 8 p.m. Eastern of Storytime. It is a time where Pastor Tia is reading stories to kids of all ages. It's encouraging, it's life-giving, and we are able to learn and pray together at story time. And then every Thursday, uh, the ladies of CIC who are mental health advocates and faith experts are coming together with their faith and what they've learned in mental health, bringing it together and helping us all in empowering your thoughts. So take time to find empowering your thoughts on YouTube, Facebook, share it with other people, participate in it, and be a part of what the Lord is doing week to week here, not just on Sundays, but throughout the whole week. Amen. Let me just speak a word of blessing over your life before we go today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go now and be Christ to the world, CIC. Go now and be Christ to the world. God bless you. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We're so glad to have shared a time of virtual worship with you. Please take a moment to like, share, leave comments, follow, and subscribe on our social media outlets. You can follow up with our services and online ministries throughout the week at CICOrlando.org. Get connected and stay informed with Christ International Church. Receive our text alerts simply by texting CIC to 292929. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting it. Click the link in the comment section of this video to give online. Your tax-deductible donation will help Christ International Church spread the gospel of Christ around the world. For more information about the ministry of Christ International Church, log on to CICOrlando.org. On behalf of our pastors, Bishop David and Pastor Tia Maldonado, thanks for watching and join us again next time. 